Isn't it quiet in here? You're sitting in one of the finest auditoriums in the world, and it's the result of years of experience, decades of knowledge, and centuries of resources in the form of existing concert halls. I work with a team of engineers that design buildings with one thing in mind, one thing which people often don't even notice, and that's how they sound. But it didn't start with buildings for me. It started when I was very young and I had really sensitive hearing. Do you remember what you listened to when you were young? Can you recall any particular sounds? I used to just sit there, just listening to things. I used to listen to clocks, listen to trains, listen to lampposts. Yeah, lampposts tick, didn't you know? At least they used to in London. And when I went for a walk with my mum each day, I'd make her stop and listen to the lamppost to check that it was still ticking. Fortunately, I grew out of that habit. Uh, I, learned to, I learned to play the violin, and now I play the drums. But I wanted to combine my passion for listening with scientific analysis of sound. So I now work designing this, this unseen element of buildings that shapes our unconscious daily experience. So how do we do that? Well, let's start with this hall, the one you're sitting in, as an example of a building that requires a great deal of attention when it comes to acoustics. And the first thing you notice is just how quiet it is. In 1952, American composer John Cage created a piece, let's call it that, called Four Minutes and 33 Seconds. It consists of a group of musicians on stage with their instruments ready to play. And for four minutes and 33 seconds, they play nothing. And it would be great to perform that piece in here, because you'd notice just how quiet it is. Let's, let's have the opening eight bars then of four minutes 33. Did you hear the tram? No. You can't hear the trams in here, even though they stop outside this building. How do we do that? Well, when it comes to sound, there are many myths. And I'd like to take the opportunity today to bust a myth, bust a sound myth that I hear all the time. And it's that by using material that absorbs sound, you can stop sound. Let me tell you how effective that is. It's like using a nappy as an umbrella. The nappy gets wet, and the water passes through. The same thing happens with sound only it happens a lot more quickly, particularly at low frequency, which is the sound of trams. You see, the, the waveform is meters long. You're going to need a lot more than egg boxes to stop that. So behind these thick timber walls is an enormous concrete box made out of a foot of reinforced concrete. And that stops the noise from the trams getting in through the air. But there's another noise path we need to consider, and that's up through the ground and through the building itself. There's only one way to stop this sound. Uh, don't freak out, but the hall that you're sitting in isn't actually touching the ground. It's suspended above the ground using enormous springs. Enormous. And they stop any vibrations from passing up into the building. So that's how we stop the noise of the trams. The next thing you might notice is that even though the air conditioning is running, you can't hear it. So right from the enormous fans in the plant room, there's my friend sitting in one, don't try this at home, to the diffuser grills which are located underneath your seats. All of these things have been selected and engineered to be as quiet as possible. So why does all that matter? Well, it matters because silence True silence is the blank canvas with which musicians work. The human ear is incredibly sensitive. It's capable of taking in enormous amounts of information. The sound pressure that we hear in air before we experience pain is more than 10 million times that experienced in this hall when silent. So the aim is to create buildings that allow for that full range of, of sound to be heard and enjoyed and experienced as music. On the subject of music, when was the last time you went to a concert that completely blew you away? 
there's something about live sound. And there's many ways we can measure that objectively. But for me, there's only one parameter that really matters, and that's this. Does it give you goosebumps? When I think about goosebumps and classical music, I think about the great European halls of history. Concert halls built 100 to 150 years ago. And I wonder, how did those concert halls become so good? Was it that the people that designed them had extensive knowledge of sound and the way it works? Probably not. Was it that the music of the time was created for the halls of the time? Was there almost a symbiotic relationship between the music and the venues? Well, yes, that's almost certainly true. Wagner, for example, composed with one venue in mind. Perhaps it's simply that the best halls are the ones that have survived. But these halls are of great interest to me as an acoustic designer. And there's many things we can learn from them. First of all, the materials. The best European halls use thick, dense timber. The result? You get the bass. It stays in the room, and you get a warm, rich sound. Then the finishes. The architectural fashion of the day was to have enormous detail in the sidewalls and the ceiling. The result of this is that the sound gets scattered, and it makes it sound a lot more smooth. Then the volume. The volumes of these halls were enormous, meaning that the music lingers long after the musicians have stopped playing. And finally, I'll let you into a secret. There's a magic shape when it comes to concert halls, and that's a shoebox, a long, thin, narrow hall. But of course, we're not trying to simply replicate something from the past. We're trying to do something new. So you can see that in this hall, while we've referenced those halls from the past, with the shape, the materials, and the volume, the architectural concept is quite different. The concept is that you're sitting inside an instrument of very great value, perhaps even a Stradivarius. As a result, you can see the grain in the details of the walls. And that plays the same effect as all that ornate detail of the historic halls. Of course, the way we do that is by understanding sound and how it works. We can predict what effect the geometry and the materials have on the sound of the hall. But in fact, our prediction methods are so advanced now that we can listen to buildings long before they've been built. We call the process oralization. In the same way that digital photography has transformed it, the minute you take a picture, you can see it. We have something similar. So here's where I do my listening. It's a sound lab. It allows me to talk to people about acoustics without using technical jargon. It allows them to listen to some of the finest concert halls in the world without leaving Melbourne, and to listen to them back to back. But finally, it gives the people that I work with confidence that the halls we're designing, or the buildings, will sound the way that we predict them to before anyone set foot on a building site. So this hall represents a gem within a busy city. It references the past and looks to the future. And the fact there are trams outside is in no way detrimental to our experience and enjoyment of music in the hall. But what about when you leave this hall, when you step back onto solid ground and open the doors back to the city? We know that for the first time in history, more people live in cities than outside of them. And the result is that we become used to living with enormous amounts of noise. But how did we get here? How did it get so noisy? 250 years ago, something happened that completely changed the way that the world sounds. It was the Industrial Revolution, which was also an acoustic revolution. As raw materials were processed more quickly than ever before, painful, exhausting levels of noise were generated. It wasn't just the noise, it was the character. Constant, repetitive, dull noise. At the time, to own a factory was to be successful, and to make noise was a statement of power, like shouting at an enemy or terrorizing an opponent. That's still true today in many ways. Think of the motorbike as an example, or the motor car. 
So we take this noise for granted. It surrounds us and we live on the same noise, the same character, constant mechanical noise. One way of dealing with it is to put your headphones in and turn the music up. After the Walkman, remember those, anyone? We got iPods. And while my friends were celebrating the arrival of this tiny, cool device that held more music than we could ever dream of owning, I wasn't so sure. You see, iPods just don't sound that great. All modern music is compressed, it's squashed, the quiet bits get amplified, the loud bits get reduced. Then to lose more data, we throw away the parts that we notice least. What's the result? It still sounds like music, but the goosebumps get lost. And the interesting thing is that if you analyze it, it starts to look a lot like noise. So even the music we listen to, to block out the noise, is starting to look like noise. What do we as engineers do? Well, we measure it. Of course we measure it. What else would we do? We've done tons of noise measurements. We've mapped entire cities for noise. When we map noise, we see the city like a blob of ink passing, growing through tissue paper, slowly getting bigger, out of control. We can see exactly what the noise is like at any given location. But there's a problem with this method. It doesn't tell us anything about the character. Is it sound that we want? Or is it unwanted sound or noise? So when it comes to the future, there are two things that give me hope. The first of them is the end of the diesel engine. We know that electric vehicles are already with us. And we know that fossil fuels won't last forever. Now, don't get me wrong here. I'm not saying I envisage a future where we all whiz around silently in electric vehicles. In fact, a lot of the noise that comes from cars comes from the interface between the tire and the road itself, especially at high speeds. But nonetheless, electric vehicles have the potential to completely change the way that our cities sound. But the second thing is far more creative and far more exciting. And it involves us starting, as I did, like a child, listening. Listening to the cities around us. We're already working to add pleasant sounds back to cities. Water fountains, for example, children's playgrounds. And when we do that, something amazing happens. It's not that the noise has gone away, but our perception completely changes. Instead of wanting to withdraw, we want to engage. We want to see what's going on to keep our ears open. I wonder how I'd design Melbourne if I was designing it purely for sound. You know, I think I'd keep the trams. There's something unique and iconic about them. I like the sound of their bells. And I'll tell you what else, I definitely have some enormous ticking lampposts. But seriously, imagine, imagine a Melbourne city centre where the conversation noise from cafes was louder than traffic noise. Or imagine how much more enjoyable eating out might be. <laughs> imagine how much more enjoyable eating out might be if you didn't have to shout to make yourself heard. So the future offers us possibilities to control the blob of noise of the city, and in doing so, to reclaim the sounds that connect us, that tell us we're home, and reconnect us with nature. The future offers us the possibility to see this unseen element as a crucial design criterion for any building or public space. Now that gives me goosebumps. Thank you.